Protests over economic hardship continue for a fifth day today in Nigeria, despite President Bola Tinubu's call yesterday for organizers to suspend the protests and engage in a dialogue with the government. Hundreds are reported to have come out to protest in cities around the country, although there are reports that overall there are fewer protesters than over the previous days. The end bad governance protests began last Thursday and are expected to run 10 days. On the streets of the capital Abuja, many people support the protesters who want government action to fight the surge in prices, rising unemployment and other economic problems. The man, this man, gave his name as Chucks and says the government needs to act. All we are asking is for the government to implement policies, work on uh, refineries, uh, alleviate the poverty rate of Nigerians, stop borrowing and squandering themselves. I think these are the things the protesters are asking the government to do. Victor says he is a civil servant and says protesters are not satisfied after the Tinubu's speech. For me, it's a matter of uh, the reality on the ground. Uh, I'm just an individual. Majority of the civil society people involved in the process, the, in the protest, the activists, are not convinced that enough uh, actions, enough responses have been put in place by the government. Housewife Chioma says the protests could go even further. I'm in support of the protests. In fact, I'm in support that people should shut down the economy and sit at home for these remaining 10 days. Because our government, they don't have our interest at heart at all. Today, Nigerian news media report that security officers arrested Michael Lenin, one of the leaders of the protests in Abuja. On Sunday, Lenin had criticized Tinubu's speech, saying the president had justified police violence against protesters. Since the protests began, there have been media reports that as many as 17 people have died in protest-related violence. Police officials say at least one security officer is among those who died. In his speech yesterday, Nigeria's President Bola Tinubu offered condolences to the families of those who have died in the protests. He called for protesters to engage in talks with him to address their concerns. My dear Nigerians, especially our youths, I have heard you loud and clear. I understand the pain and the frustration that drive this protest. And I want to assure you that our government is committed to listening and addressing the concerns of our citizens. But we must not let violence and destruction tear our nation apart. Just over a year ago, our dear country, Nigeria, reached a point where we couldn't afford to continue the use of temporary solutions to solve long-term problems for the sake of now and our unborn generations. I therefore took the painful yet necessary decision to remove a subsidy and abolish multiple foreign exchange systems. These decisions are made were necessary if we must reverse the decades of economic mismanagement that didn't serve us well. Yes, I agree, the box stops on my table, but I can assure you that I am focused fully on delivering the governance to the people. In conclusion, security operatives should continue to maintain peace, law, and order in our country following the necessary Convention on Human Rights, to which Nigeria is a signatory. The safety and security of all Nigerians are paramount. That was Nigeria's President Bola Tinubu speaking to the nation on Sunday. As you just heard, Nigerian President Tinubu has called for a suspension of protests by youth, asking them to give room for dialogue. 
A Kenyan former permanent representative to the UN has criticized a U.S. government over a lecture on governance issues, even though Nairobi agreed with it. The matter concerning the ongoing vetting of nominated cabinet secretaries is about those supposedly tainted by integrity issues. The U.S. Embassy on Thursday called on Kenyan MPs to reject those with tainted integrity coming in the work of protests that had forced President William Ruto to sack his entire team of ministers. As Kenyans look ahead to the vetting of cabinet nominees beginning today, we recognize the importance of integrity in public service and National Assembly's vital role in upholding Chapter 6 of Kenya's constitution, the embassy said on August 1st without naming names. But Martin Ikimani, Kenya's permanent representative to the UN in New York until April this year, saw the U.S. commentary as a lecture the country doesn't need. In fact, he saw it as a diversion from Washington's own failures on global scale, one of which includes the ongoing war in Gaza, where ceasefire has been elusive. Since my former... Ministry of Foreign Affairs colleagues are restrained by their diplomatic sensibilities. I will respond to this grating lecture from a U.S. experiencing political violence, promoting trust in its electoral institutions and an uncertain transfer of power. Dr. Kimani, now working for a think tank in New York, wrote on his ex but on Friday, Kenya said it would not respond to the U.S. Embassy comments, even though it agreed with the call for integrity issues to be prioritized. The statement by the U.S. Embassy expresses a view that aligns with that of many Kenyans and is consistent with our constitution, said Dr. Koril Singoi, Kenya's principal secretary for foreign affairs. The dissolution of the cabinet was initially a product of intense pressure from youth protesters who initially began by forcing the government to withdraw a controversial finance bill. Initially, the U.S. government steered clear of the protest before cautioning Nairobi on the use of excessive force on protesters as well as representing civil liberties. The new team of cabinet nominees includes some politicians are from the opposition with some who have been dragged before courts to answer questions of misappropriation of funds. The U.S. government itself, however, has been in an awkward position just as the protests began in June as some critics urged that it had looked the other as Nairobi prepared a controversial set of tax laws. Washington designated Kenya a major NATO ally, which would normally grant Nairobi access to some military tech from the U.S. at a price. Since then, however, Western diplomats have walked a tricky path of speaking for civil rivalities while careful not to hurt the developing ties with Ruto's government. Ruto in May went to Washington, becoming the first African leader since 2008 to make a state visit to the U.S.